Good morning. Um, I, uh, I, I thought about not having notes to this talk and, and then I chickened out. Uh, but, um, and uh, I think uh, I would like to, for everyone here and for those who, who are watching online, uh, need to introduce myself. Um, my name is Tenson Chuck Ramey. Um, I live in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and uh, I've been uh, coming to this place for more than 20 years. I've been practicing here for more than 20 years. Roshi has been my teacher for that time. Um, because I live two states away, um, and after two years of, you know, pandemic and um, just everything, um, it's a privilege to be here, a privilege to be here with you all today and to be uh, in your presence. Um, I always feel like there are certain sort of preliminary things I need to say before we even try to do this. <laughs> uh, first is to say thank you for, to Roshi and Shinko and Yose Kashin, to uh, Koten, Carol, Coco, Ben, those who hold this place. Uh, this is a very special, unique place. And it takes a lot of work and effort to make it happen. Um, I've been very blessed and fortunate in my life to be able to practice at all. Um, I try to keep in mind, uh, you know, those people who, you know, in the Bob Dylan's line, um, you know, those who are on the unarmed road of flight, you know, uh, those people who are just trying to, you know, find clean water, <clears throat> feed their children in the world, you know, and the idea that I could actually do this <clears throat> is just such a privilege. Um, I also want to say that uh, I've always been humbled by the process and Rosie does this to you on purpose. See? I mean, he, he has, I think he has a, he has a motive behind it uh, because it's difficult to prepare for, for me, it's difficult. Uh, and it's difficult because, uh, because I have to ask tough questions of myself if I'm gonna be authentic, because I have this tendency to be in my head. You know, I want to intellectualize it, I wanna analyze it, I'm gonna, you know, and as recently as last week, you know, Roshi hit me with that stick. Um, say, you know, I don't pretend to have any magic. Uh, and uh, all I can do is share my experience. And I wouldn't pretend to make a judgment about what anyone's experience is. I just think that's honest, you know. Uh, so some of you uh, have heard, you know, you know me, you've known me for a long time. Others have never met me before. I'd like to just tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I, uh, I, was, uh, I grew up as a kid from the time I was about six years old uh, in a fundamentalist Christian environment in a Pentecostal church. 
Now we are talking about, you know, that's those terms you've all heard, holy rollers and what, you know. My parents were the children of dust bowlers. My mother was from Oklahoma, my dad was uh, from Arkansas. And I grew up in this very loving community in a small town in the mountains of Northern California. Um, was great, you know, potlucks were great because I had about 10 grandmothers, you know, and you had to eat everybody's pie, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, and, and what happened is that I, uh, without going into the details of it, I rejected that in my life early on. By the time I was, uh, you know, really off, actually a sophomore in high school. And then especially uh, when I became a, uh, you know, a senior in high school and, uh, you know, I used to go to, to church and I, and I went to church, you know, I had to go to church on uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Uh, <laughs> you know, three night, three, three times a week and and, uh, but, you know, I'm a senior in high school, the Vietnam War is raging and, uh, you know, a friend of mine came back in a box and the preacher did the funeral and said, well, this is a godly, this is a war of the godly against the ungodly. I think at that point I knew I was done. Yeah. Uh, and so for about 20 years, uh, you know, I got married very young and I, I, uh, I threw out anything that had anything to do with spirituality. Actually, for me, for many years, many years, it was it, being in a church would have been like fingernails on a chalkboard. Because that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, uh, that talk. Um, and then uh, I began searching and uh, uh, and I was influenced by reading uh, and listening to Joseph Campbell and, uh, and in particular, Gary Snyder, the beat caller, who by the way is I think he's 95 now. Uh, and, um, and what really drove me to practice, was to get out of my head, you might say, was uh, my health. Uh, a doctor, my doctor sent me to a stress reduction program. It was called... Uh, it was uh, it was actually called full catastrophe living. <laughs> it was the John Cabot Zen program, uh, and uh, and you know I think I think the sanitized title of it that they had at Kaiser was uh, it is uh, stress reduction, mindfulness stress stress reduction, and uh, chronic pain control, and. Uh, so uh, that exposed me, and uh, as a result of that, without going into detail, for three years, I, 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 I participated in uh, a group that sat in, in Vipassana meditation, mindfulness meditation. Uh, and uh, through a series of events, I ended up here. And those events were that I went out uh, to do a one-week uh, uh, alone time and fasting retreat uh, at Upaya Zen Center in New Mexico. And this has got to be, I don't know, this is 1999 or something like that. And um, there I met Nyose Kwong. <laughs> And um, 
he uh, he was a resident, and uh, I in the in the process of the decompression from being in a lone time in the wilderness, all of us were in a, a circle for twelve hours talking about it for about twelve or thirteen of us, and. Uh, I talked about Gary Snyder at some point, and he said, come to my room, showed me a hand calligraphy, Gary Snyder's hand calligraphy of Snyder's poem, The Smokey the Bear Sutra. And he said, uh, this was a gift to my father, you need to come meet him. So um, I'm 73 years old. Um, I don't want to accept it. My wife makes clear that I'm what that's going on right now. That I'm in denial. I I, I acknowledge it. <laughs> um, and. Uh, you know, I've been married to the same uh, woman for 53 years. Um, during the pandemic, I think we did about 100 jigsaw puzzles. You know, we have, we have closets full of jigsaw puzzles. Uh, and uh, I think that if there was, a, if there was for me a blessing in, in this thing, uh, it was the fact that I'm probably now closer to my wife of 53 years than I ever have been. You know, um, so the you know 73 years old, and we all of us are aging. And uh, for me, I look around and I experience on a daily basis. It's like the world's falling apart in a lot of ways. The people I know, right? Uh, for the last five, six years, uh, Karen uh, has, uh, uh, she has a progressive uh, autoimmune lung disease that's life threatening, and particularly during the pandemic. Very, very risky business because uh, she gets infusions every six months that knock her immune system down. Uh, I have a brother-in-law that's two years older than me that's in advancing stages of Alzheimer's. You know, I have a close friend in Portland who's younger than I am, who's had his third back surgery and is confined to his bed in his living room. And of course, we all have had friends and relatives who passed away. So you get the picture, right? <laughs> you know, uh, actually in my, uh, in, in my circles, uh, in family and friends, uh, oftentimes when we get together, it's, it's, uh, there's a big joke. It's like, well, our, our conversation is actually an organ recital. Mm -hmm. You know, we're actually, you know, it seems to be all we talk about is our ailments and, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's just, it's crazy. Well, and of course, we're all in this boat and uh, to one degree or another. But, you know, we, we don't, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no getting out of that. And uh, this says nothing, by the way, about the disasters in life that we see. Uh, I, I don't know, I, you know, it just becomes crazy for me. You know, a five-year-old child dies in a panel truck in San Antonio, Texas with 50 other people. Just because they're trying to find some place safe to live. You know? Um, and then, you know, you think about that with, 
uh, this last week, the stunning, the stunning pictures of uh, from the James Webb Deep Space Telescope. It's just, you know, I'm I'm left speechless. I I, I don't I don't even know what to say about. It. You know, it's it's almost arrogant to even think you could say something. Actually, Jo Quebec, if anybody has read her uh, in her book, I think uh, someplace in Every Day's End, she says maybe less said in the Zendo is better. <laughs> you know, it's, let's just let's not say too much. Um, well, so uh, I you know uh, I wonder. You know, uh, so this brings me to this. Uh, is is wh why did I start this practice to start with? I mean, what? Why did I do? Why do I do this stuff? My friends, my relatives, all you know. My wife is incredibly supportive. My kids are supportive. None of them practice. Uh, but I often wonder why did I start in the first place. And, and let's face it, the practice is not easy. You know, it, it's physically demanding. And especially as you get older, believe me, my knees know right now. It, it's physically demanding and you cannot explain it to anyone. You really can't. Looking back, the first time that I, I participated in a session, was Rohatsu in December. This is an intense, for those of you who don't know, this is a very intense uh, retreat. I think it's like three, four days, I think. And the last, it's an all night sit. I got, I had never done this before. I'm in this place and I was in such pain. I had to leave. I thought I was going to just be sick to my stomach. I was in such pain from sitting still. And then uh, the first, that was in the first time I ever went to Dokusan with Yoshi. <laughs> and he said, you know, and, and you know, this is also crazy, right? Because you go in this room, it's right over here, the Dokusan room, and it's ritualistic. You know, you sit down in this cushion in front of Roshi, and I just was dying, you know. <laughs> and I said, you know, and he looked at me, well, you can ask a question. And I said, well, what am I doing here? What, why am I even here? You know, and he, <laughs> he said, you chose it. You chose to come here. And I said, well, I'm just, I'm in such pain. This is just, I, this is killing me. And, and uh, he, said, uh, he said, well, remember, you're not hurting yourself. They've been doing this for a long time. And then he goes, and remember, and he today will, he'll say he doesn't remember this, saying this. He said, your, your ego wants you to become ill. And then of course he'd ring the bell, get out of here. You know? And I thought about it for months. What was he talking about? You know. Uh, and then in 2006, uh, it was the first time I was asked to serve at Shuso in the Ongo month long retreat. That's when I first met Koten. Uh, and uh, I was trying so hard <laughs> to be a good Shuso that it was just, it started out a complete disaster, you know? Because the, is, have all of you here participated in Oriyoki? Most everyone. So, you know, there's only a hundred steps to Oriyoki meal. 
right? And I am, I'm in the yurt down the hill and the first Oriyoki meal, I didn't realize was in, you know, I didn't know, I, was, I don't know how I lost track, but I got to the Sangha house, everyone, there's about 15 people sitting in their robes waiting for me. And I had to go clear back down the hill and get my robes on. It's just, you know, I was just beside myself. And, you know, all I felt really was support. And, <laughs> and uh, I, had, uh, I had such anxiety about that responsibility. And, you know, Roshi saw that. And uh, to give you an idea, you know, how bad it was, the other, one of the other responsibilities she saw is uh, to uh, ring the wake up bell. Now this bell is at uh, quarter to five, it's 445, 430, uh, yes, I said 430. So you come into Zendo, so I come up the hill, come into Zendo, you know, get the bell off the altar, and then ring the whole property, walk the property, go all the way, you know. And so I was in that pattern, I was doing that. And then DeWitt, who was a resident here at the time, I, 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 my alarm went off, I go down, I'm, I'm ringing the bell, ringing the bell. And he came up the hill and he goes, Chuck, it's one o'clock. <laughs> and I'm waking everybody up you know it's like that's what it was like and Roshi gave me a you know this big mall to carry with me had had eight big beads on it it was like, like this big and he said now I want you to carry take this with you everywhere you go because he knew you know I wasn't present and then, of course, the first thing I did is just leave it and forget it. So, so you know, I think I think that I began this practice with the idea that uh, there would come a fixed point, there would come a time, a place. If I practice enough, if I did this enough, I would come to a point of ease and repose, a place where I guess I would say it this way, where I just had no responsibility. You know what I mean? I had no responsibility. I didn't have to do, you know, that's what I thought. I guess in the back of my mind, I think that's what was happening. But of course, that was not my experience. It took a number of years for me to really understand that the effort doesn't end. And this is what Rashi's always talked about, you know. It's come, I guess I've come to understand that it's a, it's a, it's a way of living. Um, Shindo Oyama in her lovely book, and if you don't know who she is, she is, uh, She's what, almost 90 now in Japan, and she's the most venerated woman practitioner and, and, and teacher in Japan. She wrote a little, great little book called Zen Seeds. And uh, it's got a, a little section on two small sections entitled uh, True Happiness and Endeavor. Uh, And it explains, I think, wonderfully the role of effort in this practice. She, she said, earnest perseverance is true endeavor. Um, so I was in Dokusan with Roshi last week, and uh, I'm going to get my phone out here so that I know my. my uh, digital life. Uh, 
I had a, I was in Dokusan with Roshi last week and I said to Roshi, I said, you know, I think I've come to understand this uh, practice as a tool in my life. Uh, it, it's, it's to help me live my life in the middle of suffering and pain and in the frightening, you know, really infuriating sort of grief stricken beauty in which we live. And, or another way to say it is a way to kind of step back and then just experience what's happening. <laughs> Roshi said, well, remember, there's no method. <laughs> there's, there's not, you know, it's no method. It's no tool. Um, and he, and he, and he talked about Dogen's reference uh, and to Z calling zazen innate, or another other uh, is that it's zazen is before reflection, uh, before anticipation, uh, even before intuition. And that's just you know okay, Roshi help help me out, you know. And uh, so, um, what what do you say? You know, what can I say? I can say that I have a new <laughs> great grandson. who's one year old, uh, and his name is Tiberius. Uh, I think Tiberius was a Roman emperor. Uh, but he's not named after him. He's named after James Tiberius Kirk, captain of the Enterprise. Uh, and He's uh, well. He's what you know. D. T. Suzuki once said, "All babies, Buddha babies." Yeah, that's right. Total innocence, you know. And you know, Roshi in his new in the new book of his talks, there's a talk called titled "Suffering and Pain." And uh, in that, he, he talks about the, he, 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 this, he says this, he says, the first noble truth is suffering and the cause of suffering is impermanence. And a little later on in the talk, he says, the second truth is that there's a cause of suffering and that is a cause of suffering and that is our inexhaustible desires. I have them, boy. I got them all the way to my feet. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, desire for toys, right? I'm not talking about desire for, you know, the new uh, Colnago uh, road bike. Yeah? I'm, not, I'm not talking about a new Corvette. Right. I'm talking about my desire that I don't want this grandson to ever suffer. I know that he will grow and will suffer. I know that. That he will explore and experience the joy and sorrow of life. But see, I want him to be happy all the time. <laughs> so 
Roshi also said in this talk, it says in this talk that claims that pain is unavoidable, but maybe uh, suffering is optional. Um, and you know, in the when we chant the four vows, we say desires are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Um, And I think I've kind of come to the idea for me that that this is not just it it, it isn't um, the practice isn't just it's like the desire to be free of pain and, of suffering or to have some enlightenment experience because certainly I'll tell you I never had lights go on in twenty years. or to have, I said earlier, bigger and better toys. But it's about, this, this is another thing that Roshi said to me in Dokusan early on. I, I saw these people wearing this apron around their neck, you know? Uh, and I asked him in Dokusan, what is that thing, you know? And he, and he really kind of sat back, kind of, I thought he was a little frustrated. And he went, this is not about being a Buddhist. This is about freedom. <laughs> no ring to bell, you know, it's like, and I, I just, you know, I, and, and over the years, I think it's, I've come to feel it for me, it's the fear of impermanence. Said, you know, I don't want it to change. You know, uh, a few years ago, uh, you know, six or maybe eight years ago, uh, Reverend Isho uh, Fushida, who at the time was uh, the uh, head of the Soto Shu in San Francisco came to the Zen Center here and gave a couple of talks. And one of the talks I said stayed with me. And he talked about the life of the Buddha, the story of the Buddha, in terms of being and having. And uh, he refers here to, uh, he referred to a, a French philosopher Gabriel Marcel and also to Eric Fromm, the social psychologist who wrote a book called uh, uh, To Be, uh, To Have or To Be. And uh, anyway, what he, what he talked about was the life of the Buddha kind of before the Buddha sat down and the life of the Buddha after the Buddha. And, uh, and put it in straightforward terms, the Buddha's life before was a life of having. And then when the, when the, the Buddha had the experience of the life outside of the, temp of the temple, um, then he made the choice to find a way to live a life of being. Now, you know, uh, I need to be careful here because I could get off in my head too much, but um, you know, uh, Fromm uh, said this, he said, having refers to things and things are fixed and describable. So we cling to things and define ourselves by these things. My view, my body, my illness, right? Mine. And he says, being refers to experience. 
in human experience is in principle not describable. And I remember uh, a few years ago that uh, Suma Palmo was here. Um, and she, uh, she started a talk. She talked about karma, but she started a talk. She said, how many of you here are Buddhists? So all these hands went up. And she said, well, good. Then you understand that the ego doesn't exist and therefore it's insatiable. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just trying to prove itself in the face of impermanence. And uh, so I've said all this stuff because uh, it's what I'm, it's kind of where I am. And uh, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't claim to truly understand anything. I just, I, I have to say that. I just do it. You know, I just show up. Because however I, however I could describe it, it helps me somehow. I've always joked uh, with my friends and uh, relatives over the many, many years I've done this. And they go, you know, when they ask me, why do you do this? I mean, you know, you aren't, you're a little crazy <laughs> with what you're doing. And, and uh, I've actually said, well, if I don't do it, I will be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I don't do this, I will be. Because I can't, you know, Otherwise, I mean, how can I do this? And uh, so I'm not going to go on much longer <laughs> uh, and give everybody a break. Uh, but I, I, I would like to just close uh, with a, a quote from Walt Whitman from Leaves of Grass. Uh, probably uh, this is this this line is maybe one of the most lovely poems about being that I've ever read. I exist as I am. That is enough. If no other in the world be aware, I sit content. Thank you.